Hello, Myrmidons. Welcome back to Greek Mythology and the Homeric Chronicles. Thanks for sharing these audio waves with me, Janelle Rhiannon. Did you know there were actually two Trojan Wars? Or that 50 years before Helen was taken from Sparta, another high-profile princess was also taken from her homeland? Well, these two events, the first Trojan War and the first princess kidnapping, were tied together and are the topic of today's episode. Let's get right to it. Before Helen, there was another famous princess hauled across the Aegean against her will. This time, it was a Trojan princess and not a Spartan princess. The woman was Hesione, King Priam's sister. What's important about Hesione's kidnapping? It foreshadows what happens with Helen and Paris, and it's an integral part of the First Trojan War. And these two events, the kidnapping and the First Trojan War, are key components in Zeus's master plan. All right, we have to back up one generation to King Laomedon, who was actually Hesione and Priam's father. And while King Laomedon ruled Troy, Priam was actually called Podarces and not Priam. He isn't called that until after the event is over, but I'll get to that. So, one day, two strangers entered the city of Troy asking if they could rebuild sections of the Great Wall that were in disrepair. These guys were actually Apollo and Poseidon in mortal disguises provided by an angry Zeus as part of their year-long punishment. Apollo and Poseidon weren't too happy about being forced into manual labor, and they were even less happy when King Laomedon refused to pay them what he'd promised. Now, these two gods, once they were released from their Zeus-imposed mortality, decided that they would dole out a little grief to Laomedon themselves. And how better to do that than to torment the people of Troy? Poseidon sent a sea monster. And I always envision like this Godzilla, scary, you know, beast ravaging the city. And this beast that Poseidon sent to Troy would just wander the countryside, snatching up people, taking them out of their beds, eating them out of their house, having midnight snacks, crunching on their bones, uh, sucking up their blood. So anyway, you can imagine how scary this was. And Apollo got busy sending a nasty plague. So you're either eaten or you're dying from some nasty plague. Well, you can imagine this is a nightmare come to life for any king. And to make it even more salty, Apollo is supposed to be the one who encouraged King Laomedon to chain all the city's young women to rocks one by one, sacrificing them to the sea monster in hopes that he could end this misfortune that was darkening his city. Laomedon was a desperate man, and he forced dozens of young women to sign up for the monster draft, sending them straight to their horrific deaths. I mean, can you imagine how they must have screamed and begged for their lives just to have their voices drowned out by the roar of the ocean? Awful. It must have been awful and heartbreaking. But King Laomedon was convinced that he was doing the right thing because the city's oracles assured him that he was. So when the lottery inevitably fell on his own daughter Hesione, he was helpless to prevent her impending death. Hesione was taken, I imagine, kicking and screaming like all the other young women and chained to a rocky outcropping of jagged boulders near the city walls left to her fate a sacrifice for Troy. Now remember, all this was happening because her father, the king, was a cheat and a liar. But Hesione was luckier than the rest because quite unexpectedly, Heracles showed up in Troy on his way home from his ninth labor, retrieving the belt worn by the Amazon queen. By my timeline, Heracles shows up circa 1302 BCE when he's about 28 and Hesione is a young 17. Heracles might be a hero, but he does not work for free. He told King Laomedon that he'd rescue Hesione, but for a price. He wanted those magic horses gifted by Zeus to Laomedon's grandfather, King Tros. Of course, Laomedon agrees to the terms, but we know he's a big fat liar. Heracles, however, doesn't know that Laomedon is a big fat liar. So he agrees and decides to rescue the princess. 
The most fantastical account, and perhaps my favorite, is the one where he jumps down the beast's throat and he hacks his way out, like jumps down and, and hacks his way out of the belly. Like you can just imagine it. So he, he kills the beast. And this version reminds me of the biblical illusion of Jonah and the whale. And I just think it's a more interesting one than a straight up sword fight between Heracles and a giant uh, sea beast. So anyway, um, he jumps down the throat of the great sea beast, hacks his way out with his big sword, killing the beast and rescuing the princess. And once Hesione is free and reunited with her family, Heracles, of course, demands the king hands over the horses. But true to form, Laomedon refused. Heracles stormed off in a rage, and Laomedon thought he'd won the day. Now, this is where I give my own little tweak in the Homeric Chronicles, because a man named Telamon was traveling with Heracles, and I have Hesione falling in love with Telamon, and I chose to do this Princess Meets Boy Falls in Love storyline because I'm actually a romantic at heart, and not every single woman has to be kidnapped and raped in Greek mythology. So this is my, that's my little telling of it. And I do believe that the Greeks had romantic love. You know, I'm, I'm sure of it. Anyway, Heracles sailed back to Hellas and recruited a group of his buddies to help him get revenge on King Laomedon. He gathered a small fleet, 12 ships, and he gathered also a very capable crew, including a young Peleus, who is Achilles' father, Telamon, and Nestor. In the meantime, Laomedon sent his young son, Podarces, uh, to Phrygia. I need to take a little side street here regarding Castor and Pollux, Helen's brothers. These guys are listed among the crew who sailed with Heracles, but it doesn't really make any sense in chronological mortal years for this to be true. So I don't include them as part of the First Trojan War for these reasons. First of all, let's look at Heracles and his covert mission to destroy Troy. He's taking men, proven warriors, not boys. So this means that Castor and Pollux have to be old enough to be seen as warriors. Perhaps they could be as young as 18 or 20. I mean, we could go down as low as 15, but it really makes sense to, to be a man about 18 or 20, right? Now, Castor and Pollux, if you were to stick with the traditional narrative of Leda laying four eggs after being raped by Zeus and from these four eggs hatch, Castor, Pollux, Helen, and Clytemnestra. Now, in previous episodes, one and two, I, I debunk this four egg narrative for chronological reasons, and I have to do the same thing here. So if we were sticking with that four egg narrative, then that would mean that Helen and Clytemnestra were the same age as their brothers. Now, this really doesn't make any sense because that would mean they would all be about 18, 19, 20 during the first Trojan War. That would make them the same age as Peleus, Priam, and Hesione. And all these characters would be in their 70s by the time the second Trojan War happens, which would include Helen. And we know that that makes zero sense. She's a young woman and not an old woman when she runs off with Paris. Okay, unless she has like a little magic Melisandre necklace that makes her appear youthful, um, at a hundred years, but I doubt it, and I, I'm digressing. I, I just I throw in the George R. R. Martin when I can. Sorry. All right. So, if um, Castor and Pollux were there for the first Trojan War, that would mean that their parents, Leda and Tyndarius, who is Leda's husband, are older than even Priam by a generation at least, putting them at almost 100 by the time of the Second Trojan War. Now, considering that Tyndarius continues to insert himself on behalf of Sparta while Menelaus is away fighting the Second Trojan War, it just doesn't make any real sense that he'd be that old. Tyndarius' story even continues beyond Clytemnestra's revenge on Agamemnon, making him about 118 or 120 when you consider adding the 10 years of the Iliad and most of the Odyssey years. And for these chronological problems, I made the decision to leave Pollux and Castor out of the first Trojan War waged by Heracles. Now back to Heracles sailing across the Aegean to Troy. They landed secretly on the beachhead and Heracles told Nestor to watch the ships while he takes a stealthy commando group 
into Troy to sack it, kind of like a Viking raid, you know, hit and run. But King Laomedon scouts reported the small war fleet and he launched an organized attack on the beached ships. Well, he was expecting to surprise Heracles and his troops, but actually the surprise was on him because he'd been outsmarted. And when he got to the ships, he only found a few guards, but he didn't realize this mistake until it was too late. While he led his Trojan army to the beach, Heracles raided the citadel behind him. Turning his army around, Laomedon made straight for the city where they bumped into Heracles, who was returning from his successful raid with Hesione and the mythical horses in tow. A desperate battle took place, and in the end, Heracles killed King Laomedon and all his sons except for Pardarses, who arrived just in time to witness the final destruction of Troy and his sister being hauled off as a war prize. Hesione begged for her brother's life, so Heracles allowed Pardarses to live, and from then on he was known as Priam, King of Troy. He set out to refortify the existing walls and built a controlled gate system to keep the citadel safe from future attacks by any enemies, which we know are coming. Priam always felt guilty about letting Hesione go and not fighting for her return. In the Song of Princes, I write, Troy, 1251 BCE. A crisp breeze swept across the balcony a clear sign that Persephone once again prepared her journey to the underworld. Priam pulled the heavy wool robe tighter across his chest, returning to his seat near the hearth. Is this what happens when men get old? We sit unraveling our regret from the tapestry of our lives. He sank back heavily into the chair, staring with watery eyes into the dancing flames. Ezioni. Priam felt so guilty, in fact, that he twice sent emissaries to Salamis to negotiate for his sister's return to Troy. Both missions failed, but it was the second time when Priam sent Paris that the two worlds, separated by the Aegean Sea, would once again clash in another Trojan War. Well, that's it for the first Trojan War and the first Kidnapped Princess. If you want to find out more about how these characters' backstories contributed to the Second Trojan War, pick up the Homeric Chronicles Book 1, Song of Princes, and Book 2, Rise of Princes, at Amazon. Book 3, a title I can't quite settle on, is coming out later this year. For now, what do you think about Heracles' actions against Troy? Did the citizens deserve death just because their king was dishonorable? And how dishonorable was King Laomedon? Should he really have to give up the magical horses that he got from Zeus? And what made him think he could get away with that? What do you think about my timeline logic so far? I'd love to hear your thoughts, answer questions, and connect with my fellow Greek mythology lovers. You can visit me at my webpage, JanelleRiannon.com. You can find me on Twitter at The Raven Angel quite often. My IG account is Janelle underscore Rhiannon. And on Facebook, you can find me at Janelle Rianne and Author Page. Until next time, drink your wine and be merry, Myrmidons. <laughs>